Well, hello, my name is Tim Lohner, and I'm a consulting environmental specialist in American Electric Power's water and ecological resources section. And today I'm going to talk to you about our work with the Electric Power Research Institute, Cardno, and Pheasants Forever, during which we are evaluating the performance of native seed mixes on right of way construction projects. And frequently, we um, run into problems with different sites where we have vegetation failure. So you can see the slide here where a typical turf grass mix was used to establish vegetation on a pond closure project in West Virginia. And a lot of times these grass mixes fail due to drought or hot weather or poor soils. Um, so we had a lot of challenges here. And so we need to um, come back and continue to reseed these projects. It starts to cost a lot of money. And of course, if you have vegetation failure, you can have erosion problems such as seen in this photograph here, which can lead to additional expenses when we have to come back and repair the damage. So we got to thinking over the past several years, there's been more and more of an emphasis on the use of native vegetation to support not only pollinators and wildlife, but we felt that at least theoretically native vegetation could perform better than native seed, I'm sorry, than turf grasses. So why not use seed mixes that are more appropriate to the region, to the climate, to the soils, et cetera. So here's a, a photograph of a site in Virginia where we did test a seed mix. You can see the native grasses, you can see the um, partridge pea and the clover in the mix there. It performed really well. And some of the reasons for why a mix like this could do better would be to the deeper roots. So you can kind of see in this schematic here with the deeper roots of native vegetation, it's also more ecologically appropriate. It's better for the wildlife, the insects, the birds, the rodents. And if we could establish native, well, if native vegetation could hold up during the dust bowl, we felt it certainly would be able to work for us in our applications. Also, on our right-of-way sites, we want to inhibit tree growth. And what we're trying to do is reverse engineer the concept of plantation release. So you can see in this photograph, on the left, an herbicide was used to allow these trees to grow. On the right, you can see they're doing mowing to inhibit the grasses and the weeds that are growing, which are preventing the trees to grow. So we thought, what's, let's reverse engineer this so that we want dense grasses and dense herbaceous vegetation to grow to inhibit the trees. So that's what we're gonna to try to do in this project and test this application. Of course, with any project that's done with an electric utility, we have to have a good business case. You know, we can't do this just to be nice, just for the birds and bees, regardless of how important that is. So our business case here is with native seed mixes, if they work better than turf grasses, um, we could get better erosion control, woody plant suppression, get the ecological benefits, and also could help us with community engagement. You have to remember that most of our work is done on easements. We do not own the property. So we have to work with the property owners, work with our customers on what they want on those easements. A lot of customers aren't particular, but others are. So we need to accommodate those concerns. In addition, if we're successful with keep inhibiting the tree growth, that would mean less time in the field to control the trees. So there'd be less time of having workers spray herbicides to control the trees, less time flying in helicopters to inspect the lines, or a lot of times from the helicopters, they'll drop down saws, you know, cutting equipment. And these are all safety hazards hazards, you know, exposure to the pesticides, just exposure to different conditions. And if we have less of this, there would be a safety benefit, which on its own would be more than enough justification to proceed with this study. So we worked with Cardno to develop the seed mixes, and we applied them at three different sites within our service territory. You can see we're a very large company. We have operating territory in 11 different states, and we created a variety of seed mixes that are regionally appropriate, and we tested them at a site in Oklahoma, a site in Ohio, and a site in West Virginia. And each one of these are 
geographically very different. And we also developed criteria to be used to create the seed mixes. And among those is the seed mixes had to be applicable to multiple situations. We're talking about dry upland areas, bottomland areas, coastal plains, semi-arid areas, as well as steep slopes. One of the challenges is that the seed mix had to be comparable in cost to a traditional turf grass mix. We also asked that if possible, it could be herbicide tolerant. There's a lot of forbs out there that are more tolerant to herbicides than others. So if we're gonna put some forbs in these seed mixes, those are the ones we wanted. We wanted it to inhibit tree growth, um, be quick germinating as has been mentioned before. Stormwater control requirements mandate that you have at least 70% coverage before you can leave a site. And as long as you don't have that coverage, you have to continue to have inspections, which increases your cost, your operating cost. So we wanted quick germinating seeds and vegetation. We did not want to include any federal or state listed noxious weeds. Um, species had to be tolerant of poor soils. A lot of locations, particularly like in Eastern Kentucky or West Virginia, the soils are very poor. So you need species that'll do well in those environments. We also had to have a suitable cover crop that would work during all seasons. You know, we have construction year round. A lot of times people will say, we'll use oats when it's cooler, use rye when it's warmer. We actually developed these seed mixes that included both oats and rye so they could be used at any time of the year. And also in our Western territory, we wanted to look at and consider fire risk. You don't want some of these invasive grasses such as cheat grass to come in, which grows very quickly and dries out and creates a fire risk. So we wanted to avoid anything like that that would cause a problem. So as I said, we applied these seed mixes in three different locations in the east. It was a station project and the seeds were hydro seeded in the winter of 2020. In the Midwest, that's Ohio, it was a 138 KV line rebuild and we broadcasted the seeds and followed with a straw mulch in the fall of 2019. Out west in Oklahoma, it was a rebuild of a transmission line and that seed mix was drill seeded early summer of 2020. And one thing I wanna point out is these seeding methods were different from each location because that's just typically what's done in those places. In the east where we have steep slopes, Hydro seeding really is the only way to get the seeds on the ground. In the Midwest, it's flatter. You can broadcast the seeds out West. Typically it can be very dry and arid, so they use drill seeding. And these were live construction projects. So we didn't have a lot of say so on how it was done. We had to work with the contractors and pretty much say, okay, you're gonna switch out your turf grass mix and this is what we want you to use. So I'll go through some photographs of each of these sites and show you what it looked like. Um, several months after the seeds were applied. So in our east location, which was near Beckley, West Virginia, you can see on the left is the control plot. That's a typical turf grass mix. Compare that to the test plot in 2020, and these photographs were taken at about the same time. So you can see they're performing more or less in an equivalent manner. Um, you can see a lot of the cover crop on the right, and deep down in there, there are some forbs beginning to develop. On our Ohio site, the control plot actually was not a turf grass mix because this site went through a, the Clear Creek Metro Park, which is near Columbus, Ohio, just south of Columbus, Ohio. And the park didn't want a turf grass. So for their control plot, there they wanted their own native seed mix. And then we tested our other native seed mix on our side. You can see the two different plots about the same time of the year, July, August, and how they're performing. We did have a little bit of trouble with too much straw mulch on the test plot. If you look to the right, you can see there's a lot of straw in different places, which inhibited some of the seed germination. So we were learning as we went through this project. Western site, as I mentioned before, it was drill seeded. So you can see the rows of vegetation. Um, this is early June. Remember this site was um, drilled in early summer. So later in the summer, late June, it came up fairly quickly. And mostly what you're seeing there is the cover crop. Um, to the right, you can see some bare spots. And what that was due to something we didn't really anticipate was grazing by livestock. If you look way in the 
In the back of the photo to the right, you can see some cattle there. They really liked the native forbs and they went right for them. Um, regardless, the vegetation was able to establish despite that um, grazing pressure. And what we did to evaluate the sites is we used one meter square sample areas. We established three in each location. And we tried to put these in places where the vegetation was doing really well or just average or actually not well at all because we didn't want to bias our test results. And within each of these one meter square sample areas, we looked at the percent cover of total herbaceous vegetation, looking at desirable species, undesirable species, the temporary cover crop, wildflowers, grasses, evaluated erosion, the height of the vegetation, species richness, and whether or not it was blooming. So our conclusions to date, and that was um, by October of last year, we found that the seed mixes can be economically purchased by contractors from local seed suppliers. That was important because, you know, we're not gonna like buy the seeds and sell it back. This is, these seed mixes are something they're gonna have to be able to get on the open market. We were able to get the 70% coverage using all different, all three different seeding applications. There is a potential for some cost savings by using less straws. I talked about before, Ohio, we used a little too much. There was some minor erosion. In some of the sites was not due to the seed mixes though. In other words, where we had turf grass, we had a little bit of erosion. We had some native seed mix. We also had a little bit of erosion. And as I mentioned before, had some live stock grazing problem. So overall, we felt that this was a successful test. We're actually in the first year of a two-year monitoring program. We'll be going back this year to do some additional monitoring. The native species do take a little bit longer to establish. However, the cover crops, that's the rye and the oats, provided that quicker establishment that we needed so we could get actually from 85 to 100% coverage. And so we were actually able to photo file our NOTs, notice of terminations on our stormwater permits. Um, as I said, there was too much straw. And in Ohio and West Virginia, we had a little bit of what you call straw raking. So if you get some rainwater flowing down the steep slope, it gathers some of that, pushes some of that straw into like a rake or a little small dam, and then that prevents the, the seeds from germinating. So we had a little bit of that, so we're going to use less straw in the future. Um, by September, of last year at Ohio and West Virginia, we found that the native Canada wild rye and little blue stem were the most predominant native grasses, while black-eyed Susan and partridge pea were the most evident flower species. And at the Oklahoma site, it was sand drop seed, followed by blue, blue grama and side oats grama, which were the predominant grasses. And the Illinois bundle flower was the only forb observed um, to date. So you can see already we have different species in different locations, which is what we're going for. So I want to talk about another project where we're working with native seed mixes. And this involves a partnership with the Dolls Arboretum in Newark, Ohio, which is located east of Columbus. And the Arboretum proactively on their own established pollinator vegetation on an AEP right of way that crosses the Arboretum property. So that's what you're seeing a photograph here of did this on their own, had great success. So they asked us, they could expand the project, working with us on a research project to, to six plots. Three of them would be in an agricultural area and three of them would be in forested area. So in 2016, we began testing the establishment of ecologically equivalent vegetation on the right of way. So this is a little bit different. I mean, we're still worried about erosion control, tree inhibition, things like that, but is it possible to have a construction site, come back in and seed it with a pollinator seed mix, let's say, and create vegetation that's ecologically equivalent to a native naturally occurring prairie? If you think about mitigation wetlands, you know, if you destroy a wetland, you have to go back and mitigate that wetland. You have to create a mitigated wetland. And people do studies and compare the two. Are they ecologically equivalent? So this is the same concept here. So we simulated a construction project, brought in a bulldozer underneath the right of way. You can see a transmission tower just to the right there, took out the existing vegetation. So simulating a construction project. We then hand seeded 
a diverse seed mix. Um, these were one quarter acre size plots, so just didn't make sense to do anything but hand seeding, broadcasting. And there's two trains of thought on the seed mixes here. This one on this project was a very diverse mix. So the thought is that at least something will grow to, regardless of the, the soil type, the geography, the climate, versus very specific seed mix is that we used in the study I just reviewed with you. So this site was a very diverse seed mix, hoping something will grow no matter whether it's wet or dry or what have you. And then it was straw mulched after that and within a year this is what one of the plots looked like. Very successful. You can see the black-eyed Susan growing on this site as well as we had um, asters, ironweed, just coreopsis, you name it, it was there. Um, the site is monitored eat all summer long for the vegetation itself, which species are presenting, as well as for birds, insect species, including bees, butterflies, beneficial insects. This year will be the last of the five years of our monitoring program, and we're in an exciting development for this particular project. Um, we received the North American Pollinator Protection Campaign's first Pollinator Electric Power Award for our leadership and working with the Arboretum on this pollinator friendly projects. We're really proud of this work here. So lastly, I want to talk about a project at our New Albany campus, which is located just northeast of Columbus, Ohio. And this involves the establishment of right-of-way vegetation as a demonstration. So you can see here we have eight one-half acre plots demonstrating a variety of vegetation types that a customer may want on their property. As I said before, some people are particular about what's on their property. And so if you would do a construction project and they want some say on what you put back. So if you think of turkey hunters, deer hunters, there we put, we tested a turkey mix, a deer mix. Um, if we go through a, a, a park or a, a nature preserve, they might want a bird mix or a pollinator mix. Testing a solar mix, hearing a lot about pollinator friendly solar. So we want to see if we can develop something that's low growing. A couple other right of way mixes as well as a turf mix control. And this site, it was real basic. Once we got it developed, first of all, it took us years. Um, they kept changing the location on us. Um, it took us like three years before we kind of finally got it built on the ground. We worked with, and I don't want to exclude giving credit to a variety of organizations to develop these different seed mixes. So for the bird mix, we worked with the Audubon Society. For the pollinator mix, we worked with Pollinator Partnership, the Arboretum. Um, for the deer mix, we worked with Pheasants Forever. We worked with National Wild Turkey Federation. So we worked with a variety of groups. And that alone was difficult, right? Not, there, there isn't that perfect seed mix out there. I guess that's one of the messages I want to have today is, um, there's a lot of different variations on these seed mixes, but they can all be successful. So we had tilled the site originally, then it sat for a while. So we got a lot of volunteer weeds growing up. So then we hit it with a broad spectrum herbicide. And then that sat for a while, got crusty. So we had to harrow the site. And then we hand broadcasted the seed and then straw mulch. So you see here the application of the seed mix. You can see our new Albany building in the background. And within one year, um, with minimal maintenance, we got lucky on the rainfall. There was no irrigation. We only mowed it once to control the invasive grasses. And this is what the pollinator plot looked like the following summer. You can see the coreopsis, the clover, um, just tremendous success here. Really happy with this. And even this past year, we had even more um, diversity in the site. This is what the bird plot looked like after one year. It's a less dense plot than the pollinator plot. The seed mix here was created to be taller growing, more open spaces for birds. You can't really see it here. There's some black-eyed Susan, the coreopsis, there's some daisies, clover, different things. We also had sunflowers in this mix, a um, lot of asters in the fall. It just looked beautiful with all the uh, purple asters. There's milkweed in this plot as well. And then last example I want to show you here is our deer plot for the deer hunters. Um, this was basically, um, I think they call it candy clover from Pheasants Forever. And it's basically a mixture of different clovers that, that the deer like to graze on. And I can vouch that the deer did use the site based on all the tracks I saw going through there. 
So we're real happy with that. And again, there's minimal maintenance on these sites. So these are um, things that people could use. Um, these seed mixes do work. So with that, I'll close. Um, there's my contact information and my cell number. So please feel free to contact me uh, with any questions you might have on any of these projects. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today.